Hey guys, it's winter and here we have a frosty looking card from Zotac. It is an RTX 3070 Twin Edge OC White Edition. In this video we'll go over the specs, look and feel as well as its performance. Let's dive right in. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. In the box we find the usual documentation pack which includes a user manual, some marketing material as well as shiny stickers. Going further, we find the graphics card itself and is definitely looking clean, although slightly odd in shape. More on that later on. There is also two dual 6-pin to 8-pin cables and, sorry Zotac, these are pretty ugly. Why not spend just a few extra cents and have these painted black, or even better, white? Considering people buying white cards are likely doing it for the aesthetic reasons, except for right now of course. Anyway, moving on to the card itself. As this is an RTX 3070, it features 5,888 CUDA cores and 8GB of GDDR6 VRAM, clocked at 14 gigabits per second on a 256-bit memory bus. This card has an official boost clock of 1,755 MHz, and I can confirm that on average it is staying closer to 1,900 to 2,000 MHz. Other features include 2nd gen ray tracing cores as well as 3rd gen tensor cores. Just like most modern cards, it also includes a fan stop mode that kicks in when the card goes below 55 degrees or so, making it silent. Zotec also has software called Firestorm that helps with controlling the fan curves as well as doing some minor overclocking. Port-wise, we have three Display 1.4 ports and one HDMI 2.1 port. To power the 220 watt card, there are two 8-pin ports with connectors that are recessed lower into the card and are a bit of a pain to get into especially if you're using a 6 plus 2 power connectors. Pro tip, plug in the 2 pin cable first and then follow up with the 6 pin. As you may have noticed by now, it is a rather strange size card. It is only 2 slots wide and it is reasonably short, at least in comparison to most standard size designs, but it is very tall. It seems like Zotac is mainly aiming this card for small form factor PCs. Placement of the power connectors is welcome in the builds where the card is placed vertically though. This particular positioning completely hides the power cables, making it look super clean. To be honest, this is where the card really shines. It has a very clean aesthetic that seamlessly wraps around the edges. There is nothing crazy about it. Even the light on the side is simply white rather than RGB. While I appreciate the minimalist look, I would have liked to have support for RGB just to have it as an option for the future. Right, enough talk about looks. How does this card actually perform? Well, we threw it onto a Ryzen 9 test bench to minimize the CPU bottlenecks. And in CSGO, we see averages above 300 FPS while at 4K and 370 FPS in 1080p. The 1% are 180 to 200 FPS, so in eSports titles, it is more than anybody really needs. Moving on to Shadow of a Tomb Raider, we see very interesting scaling. At 1080p, we hit 173 FPS. In 1440p, we get 120, and at 4K, it is running at 65 FPS. The one percentiles are also pretty strong across the board. Basically, you can enjoy this game on a 4K screen at a standard 60 FPS, or play with a higher refresh rate monitor with lower resolution. Next, we have Total War Three Kingdoms, and the results are very similar. 156 FPS at 1080p, 111 FPS at 1440p, and 61 FPS at 4K. Thing to note, 1% are about 20 frames lower than the average. While you can easily play at 1080p or 1440p, the same cannot be said about 4K, as it will definitely experience some stuttering. And lastly, another AAA title, Horizon Zero Dawn. In this game, 1080p and 1440p are pretty close, with 117 and 105 FPS respectively. 4K is 63 FPS, and just like Total War 3 Kingdom, due to the sub 60 FPS 1 percentiles, they will be stuttering, but not as much. With that said, FPS is a great tool when analyzing raw performance, but we always need to account for thermal and noise performance as well. It is good and well to have a fast card, but if it runs hot or sounds like a jet taken off, gaming may not have a good experience. For these tests, we ran Heaven Benchmark and the card temperature hit high 60s very quickly, but hovered there. In terms of boost, it stayed around 1900 MHz, which is pretty good, especially for a dual fan card of this size. Where this card falls slightly behind is acoustics. 
During the test, it peaked at 45.6 dBA, which is not crazy loud, but for comparison, a larger RTX 3070 Tough Gaming from ASUS only peaked at 41 dBA. With all of this said and done, is this card worth your money? Well, right now, this card will fly off the shelf even if it wasn't, as Nvidia and their partners can't seem to meet the demand. So no matter what, they will sell like hotcakes. However, once things stabilize and finally all the cards are available, then it would really depend on your requirements. If you need a small card with a punch that can fit into most mini ITX cases, or you're looking for more specifically white card, then this one is a strong candidate. On the other hand, if you want an absolute best performance and happy to pay a little bit extra, then a card with a larger cooler may be a better choice to keep both temperatures and acoustics down. I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to smash the thumbs up and subscribe for more. And we'll see you guys in the next one.